Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 23. In this lecture, we'll discuss work. This topic is covered in Chapter 7 of our textbook by Sir Wei and Jouet. Before discussing the technical notion of work, I need to define what a system is. A system is any portion or region of the universe that can reasonably be separated from the rest by a boundary. So a system is pretty much any piece or part of the universe that you can draw a line around to separate it from the rest of the universe. You don't necessarily need to draw an actual line around it, you can just imagine a line but you do need to be able to somehow separate it from the rest of the universe. So you can see the word system is quite generic. It could refer to almost anything. An atom could be a system. A crate sitting on the floor could be a system. For example, the box by itself could be a system, but you could also have the crate and the floor together be a system. A planet could be a system. A planet and its moon together can be a system. The moon alone can be a system. You can even have an entire solar system as your system. Two cars on a collision course could be a system. Or either car alone by itself can be a system. A cup of coffee can be a system. Or an H2O molecule inside that cup of coffee could be a system. So a system could refer to, um, uh, refer to almost anything, so long as you can imagine separating it from the rest of the universe. Its definition is so generic that most people don't even bother defining or thinking about the system. However, it's very important as we talk about work and a little bit later about energy and momentum, it's very important that you always ask yourself, what is the system under consideration? When we talk about the work done on the system, you have to ask yourself, what is the system? Is it just a crate? Is it the crate and the floor? Is it the crate and the floor and the building in which the floor is situated? Knowing what the system is, is extremely important if you want to correctly apply the concepts that we'll learn pertaining to work, energy, and momentum. So I'm mentioning this here because I want you to get in the habit of constantly asking yourself, what is the system that we are analyzing? So now we can turn to the notion of work. Here we want to talk about work in a technical physics sense of the word, which is a little bit different than your everyday usage. In physics, work is a measure of the influence of forces on a system. So when a force acts on a system and somehow influences or affects that system, when we quantify that influence, that's what work is. So far in the semester, we've been talking a lot about forces like friction and tension and weight and normal force. And we've seen how these forces can bring about acceleration, F equals ma. And of course, the acceleration brings about a change in velocity and this change in velocity brings about a change in position. And so forces really do influence the world around us because they bring about motion. They are the things um, that move objects. So we'd like to have a way of quantifying that influence or that effect of forces. That's what work is. I'll give you some equations to calculate work precisely in just a minute. But for now, I just want to focus on the concept of work. Specifically, if you were the one trying to come up with an equation, what would be some of the parameters or variables you would want to include? Well, a system is influenced by the magnitude of forces. If we're talking about the effect of a force on a system, obviously the magnitude is important. Imagine you're pushing a crate across the floor of a warehouse. Well, it matters whether you're pushing with 10 newtons of force or 100 newtons of force. 100 newtons of force will probably have a lot more influence or a much bigger effect on the crate, whereas one newton of force might not even move the crate, it might not have any influence on the crate. So the magnitude matters. When we write down an equation for work, we expect the magnitude of force to show up in that equation. 
A system is also influenced by the direction of forces. In other words, if you're pushing this crate, it kind of matters which direction you're pushing it uh, in. For example, imagine the crate resting against a wall. If you're pushing the crate against the wall, so in a direction perpendicular to the wall, then the crate is not going to move at all. In that case, we might say you're not having any influence on the crate. But if you push the crate parallel to the wall, then it would probably begin to slide along the wall. In that case, we can say, ah, there is some influence on the crate. Lastly, the influence is manifested through displacement. In other words, if you want to actually observe the effect or influence of forces on systems, you need to watch those systems move. There needs to be some displacement. Okay, so imagine yourself, for example, walking up to a large building, putting your hands on the walls of that building and pushing against that, that wall with all your might. Well, you can do this all day long, but you would not really have any influence on that building. You would not really have any effect. Your pushing would not have any effect on the building because there is no displacement. That building or that wall is not going to budge. Its displacement is going to be zero. The change in its position is going to be zero. So we would say that the influence has been zero or non-existent. So these are the three parameters, magnitude, direction, and displacement, that essentially uh, affect um, or measure the effect of forces on systems. And so these are the three parameters we would want to see in an equation for work. Well, here's the equation for work, if you want to actually calculate the numerical value of work. At least for a constant force, this is the formula you would use. We'll talk about variable forces uh, in our next lecture. So work denoted by W, this is uppercase W. Don't confuse it with lowercase W, which stands for weight. Work is equal to force times displacement times cosine of theta. In this angle, theta is the angle between force and the displacement. So um, think about what we're talking about here for a second. We have a system like a box or a crate and a force is being applied to the system like you might be pushing on that box. And so that's one vector, the force that you are applying. And as a result, uh, the box is going to move. There's going to be some displacement. That's delta R and that's a second vector. The angle between these two vectors is denoted as theta. Now, in the simplest cases, the angle is zero. Like if you're the only person pushing on a crate, then you're going to push, let's say, to the right, and the crate is going to move to the right. So F and delta R will point in the same direction. So the angle between them will be zero. But in more complicated situations, there might be two or three or more people pushing and pulling on the crate in different directions. In which case, uh, your force and the displacement of the crate may not point in the same direction. There might be some angular difference between them. That's the theta that goes into this equation. Also notice that this F is the magnitude of force, so it's a positive number. This delta R is the magnitude of the displacement vector, so it's a positive number. And cosine of theta well, that could be positive or negative, depending on what theta is. If theta is 0, then cosine of 0 is 1. If theta is 180, then cosine of 180 degrees is minus 1, which tells you that work can be positive or negative. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later, but for now, recognize that work is a real number that could be both positive or negative. We will want to measure work and therefore we'll need some SI unit of work. The SI unit of work is the Joule, named in honor of English physicist James Joule. You'll hear uh, about the Joule a lot more later when we talk about energy. Let's do a practice problem involving work. A train car is stalled on the tracks. Two horses are used to pull the train 20 meters along the track with the following forces. So one horse applies a force of 500 newtons at 30 degrees, whereas the second horse applies a force of 500 newtons at 45 degrees. 
calculate the work done by each horse. So the situation is depicted here. Here's a train car carrying some uh, lumber as cargo. And uh, let's say it's stranded on the tracks. And to move it, we're going to use two horses to pull on the train car. Of course, to simplify the situation, as usual, we will reduce the system or the object of interest, in this case, the train car, to a single point. And then we're going to represent the forces using vectors. So F1 represents the force of horse one, and F2, this lower arrow, represents the force of horse two. As a result of these two horses pulling, the train car will move to the right straight along the train tracks. We'll represent that motion, the displacement of the train car, using this green arrow, delta R. Notice that the force of horse one and the displacement vector don't point in exactly the same direction, similarly with F2 and delta R. The two horses will bring about some displacement in the train car. You could say that they're having some effect or some influence on the train car. I'd like to know the influence of horse one and the influence of horse two separately. In other words, I want to calculate the work done by each horse separately. Remember how we defined work? Work is equal to the magnitude of the force times magnitude of the displacement times cosine of the angle between force and displacement. I do have two forces and therefore I need to calculate two works. So we'll calculate the work done by horse one, which will be the force of horse one, and the angle between the force of horse one and the displacement. And then similarly, we're gonna calculate the work done by horse two, which is gonna involve the force of force two and delta R and the angle for that second force. Notice that delta R is the same in both cases. There's only one displacement. The train car is gonna go from point A to point B. So no matter how many horses are pulling on this train car, we will use the same displacement in both equations. But of course, each horse is going to be exerting a different force, a different magnitude at a different direction. So we'll have to be careful about what numbers we plug in for F1 and theta1. More precisely, we can find that the work done by horse 1 is approximately 8,668 joules. So the magnitude of the force that horse 1 is exerting is 500. The displacement is 20 meters. We're told that the two horses are used to pull the train 20 meters along the track. So that's the displacement vector. And uh, 30 degrees was given to us right here. That's this angle here between F1 and delta R. We can also calculate the work of horse two. This is the influence that horse two is having. Horse two is exerting the same magnitude of force, 500. You could say these two horses are equally strong. Uh, and of course the train car moves 20 meters. So the displacement is the same. But the angle is different. The second horse is uh, pulling at 45 degrees, so we now have to calculate cosine of 45, and work two ends up being approximately 7,071 joules. If I asked you which horse is having a greater effect or is being more influential in moving this train car, you should say horse one, because as you can see, the work done by horse one is a little bit greater than the work done by horse two. Let's do another practice problem involving work, this time a more challenging one. Forces F1 and F2 are applied to a box with a mass of 20 kilograms on a horizontal floor. Force F1 has a magnitude of 100 and forms an angle of 45 with the floor. Force F2 has a magnitude of 50 newtons and forms an angle of 30 degrees with the floor. The crate moves 12 meters to the left with constant speed. Given this information, find all the forces that are acting on the box find the work done by each force, and then also calculate the total work done on the box. 
So this is a rather involved and lengthy problem. Notice that there are multiple forces acting on this box. To begin with, we have F1 and F2. These two forces are given to us, so we know the magnitude and the direction of each force, which means we can also calculate the X and Y components for each force. We also know that this box is going to move, so there's going to be some displacement. That's this green arrow, delta R. The magnitude of the green arrow is going to be 12 meters because we're told this box is going to move 12 meters to the left. We're also given a very crucial piece of information here. We're told that it's basically moving with a constant speed. So we can say that the velocity of this box does not change. Notice that if the velocity of the box does not change, then its acceleration must be zero. And if the acceleration is zero, then the net force must be zero. This turns out to be an important clue because it suggests that there must be other forces acting on this crate. As I look at this scenario, I can clearly see that F1 plus F2 is not equal to zero. You should be able to add these vectors geometrically or pictorially. If not, you can write down the X and Y components of these two forces, add them together, and you will see that they do not add up to zero. So there must be other forces acting on this crate so that the sum of these two and those other forces ends up being zero so that the acceleration is zero so that the speed can be constant. So what other forces are acting on the crate? Well, this is presumably on planet Earth, so perhaps it's not too surprising that there is weight pulling the crate down. Of course, now you should be thinking, well, the box is sitting on the floor or a tabletop. Uh, whatever it's sitting on, there is some contact there, so there must be some contact forces. In particular, there must be a normal force pushing the crate up. You might be tempted to say that the normal force must be uh, equal in magnitude to weight, as we will soon see that's not the case. If normal and weight were the only forces acting on this crate, then they would have to cancel each other out. But in this case, there are other forces involved, for example, F1 and F2. And remember how the normal force operates. It reacts, it's a reactive force, so it reacts to other perpendicular forces. What other perpendicular forces do I have? Well, weight, but also the Y component of F1, also the Y component of F2. So the normal force is reacting to at least three different forces. Are these the only forces? Well, maybe. Uh, we do have contact, so there must be contact forces. Remember that um, a contact force has two components, a parallel and a perpendicular component. The parallel component is known as friction. In general, whenever there is contact between two surfaces, you should assume there is friction unless you are told that this is a frictionless or very smooth surface. In this case, we don't really know how smooth this surface is. And notice that the problem does not give you the coefficient of friction. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that friction is there. We'll include it in our equations. We'll solve for friction. And if it turns out that F equals zero, then we can say, oh, there was no friction, right? But if we solve for F and F turns out to be seven, then you have to conclude that there must be seven newtons of friction. So now let's do a numerical analysis of the situation. Other than F1 and F2, there are weight, normal force, and friction. So we have a total of five forces acting on this uh, object, on this box. And the influence or the result of all these five forces together is that the box will move to the left by 12 meters with a constant speed. We expect that these forces, when added together, they should add up to zero. In other words, we expect the net force must be zero because we want the acceleration to be zero, because we want the, the velocity to be constant. 
To uh, analyze the situation further, we need to break these forces down into x and y components and start using Newton's laws of motion. Uh, let's start with F1. F1 is the easiest. The magnitude of F1 is given to us as 100 and its angle relative to the horizontal, so the angle um, here, is given to us as 45 degrees. Given that information and the fact that the magnitude is 100, we can construct a right triangle. We can look at different legs of that triangle and we find that Force 1 in the x direction is minus 70.71 newtons, and force 1 in the y direction is positive 70.71 newtons. F2 is also very easy. Um, we're given the angle, so the angle was given to us in the problem. We were told that this angle here relative to the horizontal is 30 degrees. So with a little bit of trigonometry, we can find that the x component of force 2 is 43 newtons approximately, and its y component is 25 newtons. Uh, the next force that we want to discuss is weight. Weight is usually an easy one to figure out. You can immediately say that the x component of weight is 0, simply because gravity does not operate in the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, the magnitude of weight is mg, which gives me 196 newtons. We were given the mass of the box. And of course, I'm going to put a minus sign in front because gravity is pulling this thing down. I'm going to consider that to be the negative y direction. So uh, the y component of weight is minus 196. This, this takes care of three of the forces. Friction and the normal force are a little bit trickier. To figure out those forces, I need to use Newton's second law of motion. However, note already that we know friction is uh, acting only in the x direction. So the force of friction could be written as some force F, which we don't know what it is, comma zero. This indicates that the y component of friction must be zero. The normal force only acts in the y direction, so I could write that as zero comma n. I don't yet know what n is. We'll calculate a numerical value for it in just a second. Here, my, uh, my intention is just to say that there is no x component to the normal force, only a y component. Anyways, to calculate the numerical value of these forces, we need to invoke Newton's second law of motion. We need to talk about acceleration and then connect acceleration to forces. We know that the acceleration in the x direction is zero because we're told the box moves with a constant speed. If the acceleration in the x direction is zero, then the sum of forces in the x direction must be zero because F equals ma. The sum of the forces in the x direction, what are they? Well, it's the x component of F1, x component of F2, and friction in the x direction. Weight and the normal force are not included because those only act in the y direction. And of course, I'm not really including delta R in our discussion just yet because for now we're talking about forces, not displacements. So I'm really only talking about the blue arrows and not the green arrow, at least not yet. Anyways, this is convenient because I know what F1x is, I know what F2x is which allows me to immediately solve for the force of friction in the x direction. When I do, I find that there is in fact 27.41 newtons of friction. So there must be some friction in this problem, otherwise this box would not move with a constant speed or constant velocity. This was acceleration in the x direction. We could also talk about acceleration in the y direction. The box is not at all moving in the y direction. It's not flying off the surface. So the acceleration in the y direction is zero, which means the net force in the y direction is zero. What is the net force in the y direction? Well, we got the y component of F1, the y component of F2. Of course, we have the y component of the normal force and we have the y component of weight. All of those are pointing in the y direction. I know what F1y is, I know what F2y is, I know what Wy is. I figured those out up here. Plugging those in, I can find that the Y component of the normal force is 100.29 Newtons. 
So this takes care of the forces. We now have X and Y components for every single one of these five forces. Therefore, we have calculated all the forces involved. Part B asks us to calculate the work done by each force. Now that we have the X and Y components, we can calculate the magnitudes. Once we have the magnitudes, we can calculate the work. So on the previous slide, very systematically, we calculated the X and Y components of every one of the forces that, are, uh, that is acting on the box. Note that there are five forces acting on the box. Each one of them is going to have a certain influence or effect on the box. Some of them will have a positive influence. Some of them will have a negative influence. The ones with a positive influence will help the box along its path to the left. The ones that have negative influence will be resisting the motion, will be attempting to slow or stop the box. Let's actually calculate the works precisely, and hopefully that will make a little more sense. Let's start with F1. The magnitude of force 1 was 100 newtons. The displacement of the box was 12. We were told the box is moving 12 meters to the left. Notice I'm not putting minus 12. I'm putting in plus 12. I don't care if the box is moving to the left or to the right. This is the magnitude of the displacement. And the angle between the green arrow and the force 1 was 45 degrees. Putting all that in, we see that force 1 is having about 848 joules of influence on the box. This is the work done by force 1. Notice it's a positive work, which means basically F1 is helping the box. F1 is responsible for moving the box to the left. Let's calculate the work done by force 2. Its magnitude was 50 newtons. The displacement is, the, is still 12. The angle between force 2 and the displacement vector is 150 degrees. When we plug all this in, we find that the work done by force 2 is minus 519. It's negative because if you remember, force 2 is pointing to the right, whereas the displacement is to the left. So in some sense, force 2 is holding back the box. In general, as you do many of these calculations, you realize when the displacement and the force point in opposite directions, you end up with a negative work. So we can say that this force is having a negative effect or influence on the box. We can calculate the work done by weight. The magnitude of weight was 196 newtons. The displacement was 12. The angle between weight and the displacement vector is 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is 0. So in this case, we can say weight is not having any influence on the box. I'm not saying that weight is not an important force. Of course, it's important. It affects the uh, magnitudes of other forces, like the normal force, which in turn affects the magnitude of friction. But in terms of work, in this case, the work that is done by weight is zero. In some sense, this makes sense. Weight is pulling the box down, but the box is moving to the left. If the box is moving to the left, it cannot be because of weight. Weight is trying to pull it downwards. Those two directions are perpendicular to each other, so we say that weight is having no effect or no influence on the box. We can calculate the work done by friction. We figured out that the magnitude of friction is 27.41. The displacement is 12. The angle between those two is 180. Remember, friction points to the right, but the box is moving to the left. The angle is 180 degrees, so the influence of friction ends up being minus 328 uh, joules. Notice that, again, we have a negative work. This tells us or suggests to us that friction is trying to slow down the box. Friction is resisting the motion of the box. The box is going in one direction and friction is pointing in the opposite direction. The last force is the normal force. Remember, there were five forces that we calculated. So we can calculate the influence of each one separately. The influence of the normal force also ends up being zero because the normal force is pointing upwards. 
whereas the box is moving to the left, the angle between them is 90 degrees, cosine of 90 is 0. So this is part B. We have now calculated each one of the individual works. Part C of this problem asks us to calculate the total work, the work done by all the forces. It turns out there are two ways that you could answer part C. One way is to simply add all of these numbers that you see here. We've already calculated the individual works, so we might as well just add these five numbers together. And when we do that, you should check this for yourself, you will see that the net work is zero. So some of the forces are having a positive influence, some are having a negative influence. The sum total of their influences is zero. This is probably the hard way to answer this question because you have to calculate each individual work by itself and then add them together. Probably the easier way to answer this question, the second way, is to say if we're interested in the work done by the net force, then we're just going to use the same formula we've been using except for F, we're going to plug in the net force. The net force in this problem was not given to us. However, we were told that the box is moving with a constant velocity. To us, that implies the acceleration is zero, and that in turn implies that the net force is zero. So if this number is zero, then regardless of what delta r and cosine theta are, that is going to give me zero. So this is a much easier way to prove that the net work is zero. In general, if you have an object moving with a constant velocity, the net work will be zero. If it's moving with a constant velocity, it doesn't have any acceleration, it's not speeding up, it's not slowing down, which means all the forces acting on it together must be balanced, they must add up to zero, which means the work done by all of them is zero. I'm not saying the work done individually is zero. I'm saying the sum or the net work is zero in that case. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.